Okay, so I'd like to start. Um, just one comment for people who are uh, attending on, on uh, Zoom remotely. If you have any questions, just uh, raise your hand and uh, Jesse will uh, monitor the responses on the Zoom. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, Sharad uh, here. I, I first met him in Berkeley and he was giving very insightful talks about the connection between uh, what we are doing in, in a theoretical uh, fairness in machine learning and what is happening in the real world. So uh, Sharad was a professor at uh, Stanford and uh, he kind of initiated all kinds of uh, uh, projects to try to uh, improve uh, fairness in in policing, in uh, in in the judicial system, uh, in uh, banks lending, uh, you know, granting uh, loans, and and many other areas. So he's one of the of the leading uh, experts in this uh, interface between uh, computer science and uh, machine learning, and uh, fairness in the real world and is involved in in uh, talking to policymakers and uh, writing articles uh, for uh, influential papers like the Washington Post or the New York Times so I'm, I'm really really happy to to have Sharad here and looking forward to hearing his talk okay. thanks thanks for that introduction um so I'll I'm going to tell you about a bunch of different things today and so this title uh, including verbal bias and everything but the kitchen sink you know in some ways everything but the kitchen sink is going to have a technical interpretation that I'm going to talk about but also it really just I'm throwing a bunch of things that are connected in my mind and hopefully you'll see some of the threads um uh yourselves I'll try to bring those out and I'll also try to keep this pretty informal so please feel free to ask questions throughout I'm happy to answer them and, and go off on tangents as they come up um, so just a little bit of background about how this whole body of work started over the last couple of years that I'm going to be talking about. Well, we we started a few years ago, um, my collaborators and I, thinking about ways to statistically quantify discrimination in human decision making. And that grew into thinking about discrimination, fairness, and, and algorithms, and also the use of algorithms to mitigate racial disparities. And, and that morphed in this way that's a little bit maybe not totally clear right now, but hopefully will be in a few minutes, about thinking about um, features outside of race and how their inclusion impacts the equity of, of algorithms and the accuracy of algorithms. So this is the rough way that, that things unfolded over the last couple of years. I'm actually going to tell the story in reverse. So once we kind of got to this punchline, it clarified at least my thinking. So I'm going to tell you the, the story in reverse chronological order. Um, and this is joint work with a bunch of uh, talented folks across disciplines, computer science, statistics, law, um, uh, and so here I'll just flash the names up for right now, and at the end I'll give you some references that, that includes everyone's contributions to, to various pieces of work that I, I will have talked about. Um, okay, so TLDR, I'm going to again try to tell you three three things, time permitting. So the first is that that common conventional wisdom is that when you're fitting a predictive model, you should throw in all information. This is kind of the mantra in machine learning. And I'm going to argue that, in fact, that very sensible advice goes wrong when we have what's called label bias. And I'll explain what that is. But this is a, a common feature of many policy problems. Um, the second is, is that even when features improve, at least in some sense, improve accuracy, they don't always improve accuracy as much as we tend to think they do. And this has the implications for the use of race in algorithms. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk about this, this phenomenon of included variable bias, where again, the there's this notion of discrimination that's that's very standard in, in, in the courts of disparate treatment. And the statistical test for understanding disparate treatment is throwing in all of your non-race features and then looking at racial disparities after adjusting for all other information and very standard approach but i will uh, argue that this can go this can give misleading estimates of discrimination and in particular this form of discri discrimination called disparate impact so these are the sense that all three of these things are connected in that we're all talking about all these relate to the idea of what you throw into your model to get better estimates of the thing that you fundamentally care about okay so let's start with um, uh, label bias and, and the kitchen sink. So 
for context, I think we're all you know roughly on the same page here, probably. But you know, to, to review, a lot of high stakes decisions are are made by estimating the the likelihood of some adverse outcome. Lending is based on risk of default. Medical triage is based on part on, on risk of adverse health outcomes. Pretrial incarceration is based on risk of recidivism. And in many cases, we just estimate these things in the absence of a statistical model. We're just using our intuition, our experience. Um, and the hope is that using statistical models to guide our, our decision-making can make things more efficient and more equitable than, than intuition alone. But I'm gonna tell you about ways in which you know, this, this story is complicated um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so I wanna, I wanna start with this uh, concrete example. So in 2009, about you know, 15 years ago in Philly, the adult probation and parole department started using statistical tools to prioritize supervision of, of individuals that were deemed high risk. And this was supposed to have this kind of twin benefit of, of moving resources to the folks who, who are higher risk you know, and hopefully improving outcomes for them, but also moving supervision resources away from people who are deemed low risk because that supervision itself was, um, uh, was onerous. And so this, you know, this was supposed to not only improve actually, but also uh, equity. And at the time, this was like, you know, 15 years ago, random forest was used. So this was kind of state of the art at the time, roughly. And it was using, you know, trying to predict um, future homicide charges based on a variety of, of features. It's going to throw in the kitchen sink to, to predict this adverse outcome that they that they cared about here. And here's a quote from one of the designers of, of the algorithm. If shoe size or sunspots predict that someone is going to commit a homicide, I want to use that information, even if I have no idea why it works. Okay, and that's, you know, this is a little bit of a hyperbolic statement, but it's very much in line with, I would say, textbook statistics, machine learning, that you just throw in everything and you let the model sort out what matters and what doesn't matter. And you, maybe there's some regularization or something happening, but basically you just throw it all in and magic happens, you get this prediction. That's kind of the, the beauty of, of this whole ML approach. And this stands in contrast to the way we think about a lot of causal inference, where we have to be very careful about understanding the mechanism of why this thing matters or this thing doesn't matter when we're trying to estimate causal effects. Okay, and so this is, I would say again, this is probably one of the reasons that this whole kind of endeavor has been so successful, this predictive endeavor has been so successful is because in a, you know, this particular sense, it's largely a theoretical. I don't need to know why, I just have information. I have this other thing that I wanna predict. So we throw it into the black box and we get some predictions and often that works quite well. Okay, so the um, initial versions of this were, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of the lab version of this thing really did include everything. The ones that were deployed included a lot of things, but it didn't include race. It did include zip code, though, which many people often think of as a quote unquote proxy for race. And then a few years after it was deployed, um, zip code was removed. But like largely, this was one of these examples where the kitchen sink was thrown into the algorithm and this was deployed to, to impact policy outcomes. Um, so there's this kind of debate that's been happening here in this in this field of you know should we be throwing everything into these types of models and the you know the way a lot of the, the, a lot of the time the way this this debate has been framed is there's accuracy and then there's equity and so on the accuracy side we should throw in everything or again this is how the the debate is unfolded we should throw in everything because either that information is useful in which case we get a little bit of a boost or it's not in which case the model will automatically learn to discard it Okay, and but on the equity side, people have argued that, well, really, you know, if we throw in things like race or zip code, then that's going to make outcomes worse for some groups of people, but it hasn't entirely been clear what we mean by fairness. And so this is a, a kind of a fraught issue, a controversial issue of trying to define exactly what we mean by fairness in this, in this, in this context. And so this has been something that personally I've been quite confused about over the last few years of should we throw in everything into these models or should we not? And part of me has been arguing that, you know, really, well, statistically, we should throw everything in and then we deal with all the equity issues separately. So once I have the best predictions I can have, I should deal with the equity issue separately, but we don't want to put all this stuff together because it's conflating issues. And that's in some ways just a textbook, machine learning, statistical point of view. Um, but my, my, what I'm going to try to convince you of in the next in a few minutes is in fact, these are very much entwined 
issues in ways that weren't initially apparent to me. And so when, it's so a why are these entwined? Well, when the target, the true target of prediction, for example, criminal activity differs from the proxy label, for example, charges of criminal activity, then in fact, the story becomes a bit more complicated and accuracy can suffer from throwing in extra information. And so this is what I call the problem of label bias, is that the thing that you're predicting is not the thing that you fundamentally care about. So in criminal risk assessment, we usually are predicting something like conviction or arrest, but the thing that we care about is criminal activity. And so we almost always in these policy settings have a disconnect between the label and the construct that we that we care about. So this is the label bias that, that I'm talking about. Okay, so let's um, let's start with a simple example. Um, and the so here is is a, a, a generative data generating process that I'm depicting here. And there are a few things to note about it. So here, this uh, I have arrests in neighborhood. These are the things that I observe, and I'm going to use these to predict future arrests. So I have past arrests in neighborhood. I'm using this to predict future arrests. But the thing that I really care about is up here at the top, which is future behavior. And here I'm going to say future behavior is correlated with past behavior and behavior is what's driving arrests, but also what's driving arrests is where you live. Okay, so if you engage in a certain level of criminal activity, whether or not you're arrested depends in part on that level of criminal activity, but also where you live because police informant and in, in police enforcement is different in different areas, and that is going to affect arrests. Okay, so just kind of pause for a minute and make sure that we're we're on the same page of what it is that you know how are the how are the data generated here? So we can we have neighborhood, we have behavior, these things interact so that we have arrest. We're trying to we can only use these two features. And the question is, should we use both or should we use one of them? We are predicting formally arrest, future arrest, but we really care about future behavior. Okay, so the structure of a lot of problems looks like this. So now textbook result is that including neighborhood. So if we use arrests and neighborhood to predict future arrests, well, that's better than just using past arrests alone. Okay. And so here, just kind of more formally, what am I saying here? I'm saying the expectation of future arrests given past arrests and neighborhood outperforms the expectation of future arrests given past arrests at predicting future arrests. So here, this is a situation where there's no label bias. I'm trying to predict future arrests. Should I use both of these? Yes, in a statistical sense, I'm always better off, or I'm always at least as good off using both of them in separate degenerate cases. I should use both of them to improve performance, right? That's kind of textbook, textbook answer. So now, if we really care about predicting behavior, but I formally can only predict future arrest, it turns out if my data are generated this way, I'm going to provably do better if I drop a neighborhood. Okay, so statistically, what am I saying here? That the expectation of my simple model, future arrests given past arrests, outperforms my kitchen sink model, future arrests given past arrests and neighborhood, if I evaluate it against its ability to predict future behavior. So I'll, I'll I'll tell you that in a minute. Okay. So here again, we're just trying to build intuition for what is what is going on. So this is a very simple example where here we can improve performance by dropping a covariant. Okay. So why is this happening? So here there's some simple intuition for why this is going on. So first, I'm going to give you kind of the statistical story, and then I'll I'll, I'll translate this. So the statistical story is if we look at if we condition on past arrests, and I say, what is the correlation between neighborhood and behavior? Well, here, past arrests is a collider, meaning that if I, if this variable increases, if neighborhood increases, so neighborhood I think of as the level of police enforcement. So if neighborhood increases, if I hold this 
past arrest fix, that means my criminal behavior is going to decrease. That's what I can infer. And if my past criminal behavior decreases, you know, likely my future criminal behavior decreases. And so these things are negatively correlated. Right. So another way to think about this is if I take two people with the exact same criminal history, then the person living in the higher police neighborhood is less likely to be engaging in future criminal activity. Why is that? Because if they're living in a high enforcement area, then with the same criminal record, they probably are engaging in fewer criminal acts. Okay, so there's a negative correlation between neighborhood and future behavior conditional on past behavior or past, past uh, arrests. So that's one side of it. So we have this negative correlation here, but the point is that in fact, when I predict future arrests, these are positively correlated. So if I am saying conditional on the number of times you've been arrested, if you live in a high policing neighborhood, you are more likely to be arrested in the future. And so you can think of this as, as uh, pointing in the opposite direction of the, how it should be. So if I take two individuals with the exact same criminal record, if I predict arrests, I'm going to say with neighborhood, the person living in the high enforcement neighborhood is more likely to be arrested. But in fact, that person is also, what we talked about earlier, is less likely to engage in criminal behavior. And so I've gotten the sign completely wrong here. So it's better to drop neighborhood when I'm making this type of prediction when the thing that I care about is unobserved relative to the thing I'm, I'm formally predicting. Yes, please. I mean, so you could you could think of it that way, but you could also think of it as, you know, let's say only 10% of the time that you engage in criminal behavior do you get arrested. And so the rates could still be different. You could still say, I'm still getting arrested for a crime that I committed, but at different rates. A lot of people are, you know, committing criminal acts without getting arrested. That's kind of the norm. Right. Okay. So here, again, I gave you a little bit of intuition. Let me just state one, one theorem here. For linear models, this always happens. And so, you know, what is the condition here that I always do better if I drop a covariate where the correlation between that covariate and the true label and the proxy label go in opposite directions. And I'm going to show you some empirical examples where this is where this is likely happening. Okay, but this is kind of the the intuition. So you know, in in linear, there's there is some kind of work being done by this linear assumption, but this holds, for example, whenever I have multivariate normal um, random variables. Okay, so um, now let's kind of see this in practice of how we. Uh, 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 how we might apply this type of result. And so here I want to you know, say that, you know, part of this result is it is theory in the sense of there's this debate that's been happening. And in my mind, there is this, there was this confusion about, you know, why might we throw something out? And it was never quite clear why we might throw something out to improve accuracy. And here's at least one story of saying why, you know, zip code could be, you know, I would say this is not far off from how we think of criminal behavior and, and, and police enforcement. And so it's like, if we believe the world operates somehow like this, then in fact, we shouldn't throw in zip code, which is the status quo right now, but it, it, it stands in contrast to the mantra of throw in everything that you, that you have. Okay, so now let's kind of switch to the healthcare context and see how this plays out. Um, so in a lot of uh, healthcare systems, uh, algorithms are used to identify what are called high-risk um, uh, care management patients that, who are provided with additional clinical resources. And so in this case, the algorithm is trained to predict health, they're often trained to predict healthcare costs. So there was, this is a, a famous example from a few years ago where it was noted that costs are not the same as healthcare needs. Healthcare costs are not the same as healthcare needs. And so unequal access to care means that black patients who are just as sick as white patients incur fewer costs because they're not going to see, uh, they're not using medical resources at the same rate. And so they're deprioritized by the algorithm. And so the algorithm ultimately is not prioritizing people with the most medical need. Okay. So Let's, you know, that result was kind of sort of known from a few years ago. And the, uh, the conclusion or one conclusion from that work is we should spend more time collecting a better label. So instead of predicting 
cost, we should more directly predict healthcare need. And that makes a lot of sense when it's possible to do, we should go out and, and collect better information on, on the label. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of imagine a world where that's not possible, where we understand that structure of that problem, but we can't go out and collect a better label on, on needs. And also in some sense, you know, needs is this amorphous concept. It's not like we can go out and easily say, this is your healthcare need. It's not something that's directly observable. So in whatever we do is gonna, is gonna be some proxy for that thing. And so this again, is I would say relatively realistic in that, that we can't directly collect information on our, on our targeted prediction. Um, okay, so I'm gonna consider two, two models, this complex and simple model. So the complex model, this kitchen sink model throws in everything that we have. I mean, I'm using the Obermeyer et al data. So the same data that was used in that 2019 paper. Um, the, uh, uh, we're throwing in everything we have to predict future costs. And so this is about 150 features. And the simple model is gonna use everything except for past costs and demographics. So like things like race. And so here, this is, I think, something like 125 features are going to, so I'm going to throw out past costs and demographics, but I'm still going to predict future um, uh, costs because that's all the, that's the thing that I, that's the only thing that I can predict. Okay. So intuitively, why would I throw out this stuff? But I can say, well, conditional on current health, which is in the model, past costs should be roughly unrelated to future health, but it's strongly related to future costs. That's the intuition. That's the insight from the 2019 um, paper. Okay, so now by the result, if that's true, we should see better performance for the simple model relative to the complex model here. And so what do we find? So this is enrollment capacity. How many people can we enroll into this high-risk care management program? You know, which people are we targeting? And here I'm showing the number of actually high needs patients who are identified by the algorithm. And so here we're using a definition of high needs that was that was given in the Obermeyer et al. paper of saying that you're you are found to have at least three chronic conditions in the future. And so that's an ex post measure of, of high needs, which is what we're using here. Um, and so what we find here is that the simple model in red actually outperforms, it's able to identify more high needs patients at any level of any program capacity relative to the complex model. Okay, and the intuition here is pretty straightforward. It's saying conditional on current health, past costs and demographics are roughly unrelated to future health, but they are directly related to future cost. And so we shouldn't include that information in these types of models. Yeah. It is, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute. It's true. And so here, you know, this is one of these cases where we sort of have to roughly understand the structure of the, the, the data generating process. And so this is, you know, in some ways, well, I'll, I'll come back to this point in a minute, but, you know, this is the catch of this whole approach. Um, so also the number of in Black patients that are enrolled under the simple model is significantly larger than under the complex model, again, for this exact same reason that we were, when we were predicting cost, we we're prioritizing white patients and this was happening even more so when we included past costs as one of our predictors. Okay, so, you know, what, what do we do with this type of result? I mean, one kind of way of thinking about it is it, is it, it just makes everything more complicated. And that I think is a useful thing to understand here that kind of, you know, especially when we, uh, our sort of mantra in machine learning, throw everything in and let the models do the work, is it breaks down in these types of examples. And so here I would say it blurs this connection between prediction and causal inference and in saying it's like we do, even in prediction, even if all we care about is prediction, we still have to think about the data generating process. And to the extent that we understand that data generating process, you know, like the extent to which race matters in future health outcomes, then you know, that information can be used to improve our, our predictive models. Um, over the last few years, we've seen predictive tools help in causal inference. And here, this work is 
pointing the other direction of saying causal inference can help in prediction. So I think in, in another sense, this is really just highlighting the fact that prediction and causal inference are two sides of the same coin, which is something that you know people have, have said repeatedly, but I think we haven't fully understood the implications of, of, of that statement. So I'm trying to highlight some of those results here. Okay, um, so now, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is this is the difficult question, right? It's making this purely predictive exercise a risk assessment much more closely aligned with how people think about you know causal inference or the social sciences or like understanding more broadly. And I think it does um, detract from one of the uh, uh, the off touted. Uh, benefits of peer prediction is that you know you don't have to think about these things, and I'm saying in fact you do. You know once you get into that world, it's hard, and I don't think there's a simple solution. But to the extent that we understand mechanisms, I think that can be useful. And so like this example here, you know this is a a place where we I would say roughly understand the mechanisms, and so when we do that, we can use that domain specific knowledge to help build better predictive models. But in the absence of that, I agree we don't necessarily know what to do um, but it's it's hard it's a hard sort of lesson for you know computer scientists like myself it's like we'd like to have these domain agnostic tools and i think in reality in a lot of these contexts we we can't do that please Yeah, so I, I think it's going to outperform both of these. And so the, the pure, this is tricky. We're kind of struggling with the types of examples we should use because you know, we want a, a domain where we, we can evaluate these things, but it can't be a domain where it's so clear, you know, it's so readily available that why do we even think about this problem? So there's a little bit of a catch-22 here. And so we can never, we're not really going to know for sure how well these things do. Um, because in the domains that we care about, like criminal recidivism, we never observe behavior. But there, the intuition is probably we shouldn't be using things like zip code in criminal risk assessments, even though we don't know for sure that that's the case because we haven't observed criminal behavior. Yes. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. Yep, do that, yeah. Okay, so... Now I want to kind of build on this theme and talk about blinding, which is this uh, debate that's been happening over the use of race in the algorithms is very much connected to the use of other features in these types of these algorithms. Um, so I'm going to switch or I'm going to continue on this, this, uh, this healthcare uh, domain, but um, uh, uh, switch it a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes. So about 1 in 10 Americans suffers from uh, type 2 diabetes. Upon learning of their condition, this is, you know, patients can manage it by, by lifestyle changes, diet, exercise. And so it's important for, for people to know early on whether or not they have diabetes. Um, but screening is costly, not just financially costly, but also the kind of time and effort it takes to go get screened. And so the general recommendation is that you don't get screened if you have very low risk of having diabetes. So roughly, I would say if you have a one and a half percent chance of having diabetes, then you should get screened. That's kind of roughly the medical recommendation. And below that risk, you shouldn't get screened. So if you're young and generally healthy, then don't, you know, the recommendation is you don't get screened for diabetes. And if you're older or have other health conditions, you know, get, get screened for diabetes. This is kind of roughly the recommendation. Okay. Um, so diabetes risk is often estimated based on uh, two critical factors, age and BMI. And so older people and people with higher BMI are, are at, at higher risk of, of diabetes or more likely, or the recommendation is that they should be screened. Um, and the debate now is whether or not we should also use race in estimating diabetes risk. And so there are two accounts of this story. So the first is the kitchen sink argument. It's like 
race is predictive, and I'm going to show you in a minute that it's actually quite predictive of diabetes. Um, and so the so the argument is, well, if we we are improving in theory everybody's outcomes if we include race in these types of models. So the kitchen sink argument. And here, this is one of these cases where there's not label bias. We can run these very high quality panels um, where we give everybody a blood test so we can accurately measure whether or not they have diabetes regardless of their risk. And so we know what the connection is between these features and the true outcome of interest having diabetes. So it's not, there, there's no proxy label issue in this case. Um, but the second you know, the counter argument to this kitchen sink argument is that it might also encourage a racialized view of medicine if we include race in the model itself. And so there's a worry that it will normalize an attitude of biological determinism uh, in, in doctors. It might dissuade patients from visiting the clinic because they don't want to engage in this, this interaction, which they might perceive as racialized in a, in a harmful way. So this is kind of in a very active debate that's been that's been happening um, right now, and others might feel like even if we kind of think don't even think about the direct consequences, it might just feel wrong to people. It's like I don't want to use race because it just doesn't it doesn't feel right that when I go to the doctor's office, my treatment is going to be conditioned in part on 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 my race. Um, yeah, please. I'm, I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, what if we give people a choice about do you want a risk assessment with race or without race? So the issue is, in, in this context, we can think of like a large organizations like the AMA, American Diabetes Association or, or these kind of national organizations of, of saying, you know, what should their recommendation be? And if their recommendation is, well, we have both of these models, and now when you go to the doctor's office, the patient can decide what model they want to use, there's still this worry here that we're tacitly saying it's okay for doctors to condition their medical advice on race if the patient wants it. And so again, the worry is that this is still too, um, uh, 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 too much of endorsement of race in medicine. So that's the, the the tension that that's at play here. Okay, and right now I'm not you know I'm 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 not endorsing either of these points of view right now. I'm just trying to lay out the the debate itself. Um, okay, so here let me show you some some data. Um, so this is so we fit a, a a risk model, kind of a standard risk model that uses age and in, in BMI. And here on the left we have a risk model that that uh, does not use race or ethnicity. And this is their nominal risk score from 0% to, to 5%. And here is the empirical rate of having diabetes for each of these different levels of, of nominal risk. And what we see here is that, especially for Asian Americans, but in fact, for all racial minorities, but especially for Asian Americans, the empirical risk of having diabetes is significantly higher than the nominal risk of having diabetes under these race-blind models. Okay, and so it's about a 2x difference. And so if you have a risk, a nominal race blind risk of about 1% of having diabetes, your recommendation would be don't get screened because you're below the 1.5% screening threshold, but your empirical risk is more like 2%, in which case your recommendation, if you believe that number, is get screened. Okay, so this is the tension. At, at play here is that we've dramatically that you know conditional on age and BMI um, race is quite informative in the sense of actual risk of of having diabetes, um, and this is an example where we looked for a lot of alternatives to race to see if we could close this gap, and somewhat surprisingly to me, we couldn't find one. And so this was an example where I thought, okay, we'll look at this, but now we're going to look at all these other features. That are that are available, and we tried a bunch of other things. We tried a combination of things, and we tried kind of flexible machine learning models, and we still have this pretty big gap. And so this is a case where where race itself seems to be predictive of uh, even conditional on other information. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So this is a little bit of a confusing confusing plot here. So this is the nominal risk of having diabetes based on age and BMI alone. So the standard 
this is roughly the standard risk assessment that you would get if you go into the doctor's office and you're you know, assessed with what is your risk of diabetes or these online calculators that are not based on race. It's just based on age and BMI. So you get you know, more points if you're older and more points if you, get, uh, if you have higher BMI, and that's what's determining this. Now, at each of these risk levels, we can go in and we can say how many of those people, or what proportion of those people actually ended up having diabetes. And this is possible because on the, in the data in which this portrayed, we have outcomes for everybody. So these are these kind of, this is called the M. Haynes data set. It's this high quality um, longitudinal study of, of patients where there's a lot of you know, blood work done and all these other outcomes that we can observe, observe for people. And so we see that if I tell you your nominal risk is 1%, in fact, if you're Asian American, it's closer to 2%. And if you're white, it's closer to half a percent. So these large gaps in the empirical risk of having diabetes compared to your um, nominal risk. Yes, please. Yeah, so this only includes age and BMI, pretty much like the, the, uh, what is standard right now in medicine. And it turns out if you throw in lots of other stuff, like looking for a proxy, which is something that we actually wanted to find in this case, we wanted to find the proxy that wouldn't be problematic to people, but would still give us the predictive power. We couldn't find one. So even if you throw in the kitchen sink, you see it can just exclude explicit race, at least in the data set that we have, um, you end up with these, these gaps. Yeah, Shai, please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think the issue here is that the argument is not... I think the hesitation that people have is not necessarily a statistical one. It's this normative one that if we explicitly endorse the use of race in medicine, that itself can lead to problematic outcomes. If we say, well, you can use zip code, the argument is that that's not nearly as problematic, including race, because now you know people, doctors are going to tell themselves different stories, patients are going to tell themselves different stories, and people will feel very different about this than if we were to use race itself. And it's the exact same plate that you know debate that happens in um, in in kind of discrimination legal discrimination circles is that race itself is a protected characteristic. Zip code is not a protected characteristic in many in many domains because of this. Yes, please. They they could. It's true. So this is you know this is in some sense. The, the the hard case where there is no proxy, at least that we could find. So it's like, yeah. I think I think it's definitely possible. My intuition is that you know if something, if you could find um, uh, something like diet, let's say, or or. Um, or even genetic makeup, I think people would think of this as very different than if you say race. I think race is a, you know, is a is a construct for better or for worse that triggers all sorts of things in people's minds. Now, here, this is a case where we don't even have to have that discussion because it's like once you find this thing, let's say zip code made this all go away, then you could say, well, is zip code any better? And you could have that discussion. I agree that it's not an entirely straightforward discussion to have, but here's a case where we weren't able to find anything. And so we're either, so the options are really use race or don't use race. And here, you know, you use, this is the one not using race. If you use race, everything becomes calibrated as we would expect. And now nominal risk and empirical risk line up. Okay. So now, you know, what is the kind of punchline of this, of, of, of that kind of plot that I showed you so far? Um, well, race blind estimates underestimate the risk of, of diabetes for racial minorities, particularly for Asian Americans, and consequently would lead to underscreening racial minorities for, for diabetes. And conversely, they overestimate the risk of diabetes for white patients and would accordingly lead to overscreening um, uh, white patients. Okay. And so this is you know, the argument, this is kind of, the, I would say, why the statistically savvy, the quote unquote statistically savvy argument is that we should include race in these types of models. And this was probably where I was, you know, a couple of years ago of saying, it's like, yeah, it's like very much like these kitchen sink arguments. It's like, there are big 
race uh, race differences across groups. Not we don't know why that's the case, but in a predictive sense, this seems to be true in in diabetes and in other conditions. And so, if we don't use it, then we're making everybody worse off. And you know, very much aligned with the the kitchen sink argument. So now I want to argue why this is actually a little bit more complicated than than um, I maybe originally gave it credit. Gave credit to. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the question here is, is it is it possible that the choice of agent BMI um, was already racialized in a sense that it was it was chosen because it is predictive for um, um, white patients more than than other folks. So it, it's it's unclear, you know, why these things. And probably there was you know something going on here. I mean, biologically, we do believe that these things are, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's it's not. It's definitely not irrelevant. I mean, biologically, we you know we think these are, um, you know, causal mechanisms. For, for diabetes risk. And so there is something, there, there is, I, I don't think these are just like purely kind of pulled out because they were predicted for one group. And these, this is a data set where, again, we have a lot of diversity um, and we have a lot of other features. And so it's not entirely obvious what else you would do. Um, but the, kind of, this is where the, much of the argument has been. It's like, you know, statisticians, you know, including me, I would say to, to some extent, at least a couple of years ago of saying, it's like, we should throw them all in if we don't, we are harming all patients, including racial minorities, including Asian American patients. Yes, please. Yeah, so, so the question, just to recap, it's like, I guess there are two parts. I mean, one is, how do you think about bias in the features as opposed to the labels? And, and how do we think about um, kind of broader um, ways of making algorithms fair that are, are looking maybe at, at, at outcomes themselves? And so for the first, I would say that, that the idea of biased features is a difficult one to pin down um, because features in some sense are just information. You know, that I don't, I can just give you information. I don't even have to call them anything. I can say, this is just things that I'm going to let you use to make predictions. And maybe if you've got higher quality information, you could predict better, but it's qualitatively different than the issues that happen in the label because the label is tied to an action that I want to take or something that I directly want to measure. And so that's like a thing where it's like clear what I mean by, by label bias. And the problem is I'm predicting the wrong thing. But the idea of, collecting the wrong features is a little bit squishier. It's not entirely clear what it means for a, a feature to be biased. It means that, you know, maybe we mean we could collect better information, but that seems, um, you know, again, different to me than saying that the, the, that the label itself is, is problematic. Now, the second thing is, I would say, where a lot of the algorithmic fairness community has gone over the last several years of, of let's try to make the algorithm fair kind of holistically after the fact. So I'm not going to talk about that too much today. Um, but I, my own view is that a lot of that, in fact, leads to problems in that, that algorithms that are much worse off. So we try to optimize for something like equality of opportunity. In fact, we make the problem substantially worse. Um, and I, I'll, I'm going to get into this. I'll, I'll at least allude to some of that in the, the, at the end. But I think this is, again, something we might want to do. I haven't seen successful attempts at, uh, at doing that. Okay, so again, kind of back to this main story of you know this is where the debate has has been focused, um, and again this the kitchen sink 
statistically savvy argument of throwing everything because otherwise we're making everybody worse off. So now why is this more complicated? Um, there are two reasons why, why um, this is more subtle than I initially thought. So the first is that very few people are actually reclassified by using a kitchen sink model that includes race in one that does not use race. So what do I mean by reclassified? I mean, your binary decision of being screened or not screened differs across these two models. So why is that? Well, the only people, if you're really high risk, then you're going to be under the race blind or the race aware model, you're going to be screened. If you're really low risk, under the race blind and under the race aware model, you're not going to be screened. And so in this case, about 20% of people would have their decisions flipped from one to the other if you were to switch models. Okay, so relatively small fraction of people. Now, the second point is, so for 80% of people, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter if I use the race blind or the race aware model, nothing that they experience, the decision will be the same. Now, the people whose decision is flipped, essentially by definition, they're gonna be close to the threshold. Because if they were far from the threshold, their decisions wouldn't be flipped. Now, if you're close to the threshold, if you're at the threshold, you're indifferent from being screened or not being screened. You know, that's exactly the point at which the cost of being screened equals the benefit from being screened. And so if you're close to the threshold, you're roughly indifferent to the screening decision. And so the only people, so the, uh, the putting these two things together, a relatively small number of people actually experience any difference under these two models. And the people who do experience a difference are roughly indifferent to the two different models. So we tried to, is there a question? No. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way of, of I'll have to remember that phrase. <laughs> um, so, you know, let's try to put some numbers on this now. So let's assume that it costs one util to screen. So I think of this as, you know, there, there's monetary, non-monetary costs of, of screening. And so roughly, I think of this as $100. You know, this is, you know, in, in line with what we, we think of as a, as a monetary, non-monetary cost of being screened. So now assume we gain about 70 utils for detecting diabetes. So about $7,000. So where does the 70 come from? So this ratio, one to 70, is roughly, we're kind of back calculating it from our the, the recommendation of getting screened at one and a half percent. And so this is the, uh, you know, roughly, I would say, in line with the utility of, of this particular situation. So one util for being screened, one util cost for being screened, 70 utils of benefit from detecting diabetes. Okay, now if we use these numbers, what do we end up getting? We get overall in the population, we get about a 0.02 util increase if we switch to the race aware model. So that's about $2 per person. And there's a little bit of heterogeneity across groups. Well, there's almost zero benefit, close to zero benefit for, for black and Hispanic patients in our, in our data set. And for white patients, it's about you know, 0.02, about $2 again. And for Asian patients, it's about 0.08, so about $8. This is all normalized into utils. So we think of a util as $100. This is about $8 per capita benefit from switching from the race blind to the race aware model. So now you can think of this as maybe being a lot or a little, but at least to me, this is much smaller than what I would have thought about when I see those big calibration plots with those 2x gaps in, in race or in risk. And so there, it's like, those are the types of plots that I'm used to looking at. I've generated them before and I've shown them to people. And I made the argument, oh, you have to use race because look at how much we are harming patients if we don't include race. Now, when you go through this type of exercise and actually reason about the costs uh, and benefits of using race, you get these types of numbers that at least for me felt smaller than, than I um, would have thought about. Okay, so now is the audience participation part. Of the uh, of the talk, so um, please vote. It's all anonymous. Do you think race should be used in estimating diabetes risk? So, it's a it's a tough question. It's a live debate. Yes, please. Does that mean that we couldn't find them when we have good as race? We couldn't find them when we have good as race. 
we surprised, so the question is, could we, in this case, why, you know, when I say we couldn't find a proxy for um, race, I would close this gap. Um, I mean that it, we actually had very poor luck at finding anything that, that appreciably decreased that gap. And so I, so I was, so we even had family history. And so my prior was, if we throw in family history, then um, we were going to account for a lot of this and empirically we couldn't. So it's surprising to me. Um, I mean, in this, it's always context specific, but in this context, we are seeing that it wasn't really capturing what race was capturing. Yeah. So let's see here. What do we got? So we got, so it's it's interesting. And so this is, um, and I'm torn myself. So obviously there's no right or wrong answer here, but we can see that this is a, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to, to, to sort out, so at least some food for thought. Um, okay, so um, uh, let me kind of give you, so this was an example where um, on blinding, there was maybe this ambiguous benefit, you know, should we, I think there's at least a, a nuanced case for should we um, include race or not in these types of algorithms. So now I wanna give you another case where we're actually removing, explicitly removing race information from, um, from human decisions. So I'm going to switch back to the criminal justice system. So after uh, a person is is arrested, uh, prosecutors often decide whether or not to charge them with an offense. And these charging decisions are in large part based on narratives that police officers write at the time of, of the arrest. There's a worry, though, that um, these charging decisions are, or, or these, these police narratives have, are, are written with racial bias, either implicit or explicit, and that the prosecutors themselves might be responding to this in ways that are, that are racially biased. And so we built a, um, a simple tool to automatically mask race-related information from police narratives. And so let me just kind of show you an example of this. So this is a stylized, fictitious example. Um, and we go from this to, uh, to this. And so we're masking things like names, which are indicative of race. We're masking explicit mentions of race, like um, black male here, but we don't, we wanna be careful not to mask things like black jacket, um, uh, explicit kind of physical descriptors, brown hair, locations because of um, segregation. And then even we mask things like officer names because officers tend to work in the same areas repeatedly and prosecutors learn this information. So if they see what officers are involved in uh, an incident, then they often know where it occurred and then they can infer something about the race. And so we built this um, redaction algorithm and then we tried to see how much race is leaking through. And so we built an algorithm on top of this that says, can you predict race from the redacted algorithms? And we also asked humans, can you predict race from the redacted algorithms? In both cases, there wasn't much race information leaking through other than the stated charge itself. So the charge itself is often tells you something about the race of the people involved, but other than that, it's there's not much information leaking through in these in these types of redacted algorithms. Okay, so this, um, we did this work a, a couple years ago um, and it inspired this, this um, law now that in California that requires prosecutors across the state to use blind charging by 2025. Um, they don't have to use our algorithm. They can they can redact these things manually if they like, but we're building um, the tools to, to make this straightforward for prosecutors in California to uh, um, uh, deploy this type of, of blind charging algorithm. Um, so one thing about this example, which I think is particularly important to understand, is that there are two different notions of discrimination. So the first is, is what's called disparate treatment, and it's a notion of discrimination that's closely aligned with, I think, what many people have in their minds about animus and explicit racial bias. And this is the type of discrimination that our race, that our, our, our blinding algorithm is trying to prevent or is able to prevent. And so if somebody looks at this and says, oh, this is the race of the people involved, and so now it's just going to trigger something in my mind, and I'm going to give them harsher treatment or something, or more lenient treatment, something like this. This is the type of discrimination that our algorithm is, is able to address. But there's this alternative notion of discrimination called disparate impact, which looks at whether or not policies 
are, are uh, justified or if they have racially disparate burdens without any real benefit. And so you can think about drug laws or something like this, where even if these were applied in a racially, you know, quote unquote, neutral manner, that everybody who's engaging in a particular activity is arrested and charged, it could still have unjustified disparate impact in that we might not see public benefit from enforcing these laws, and it might take a disproportionate toll on communities of color. And so in this case, our race blinding algorithm isn't going to do anything about that. And so it kind of highlights the both benefits and the limitations of this approach to thinking about combating discrimination with algorithms. Um, okay, so I've gone through two of the three things that I was going to tell you, but I, I know that we are that we're already at four o'clock. And so I I want to, you know, okay, so I I don't want people, if you're feeling tired, go get a cookie and, um, you know, feel free to go on to your other, other things. But I, I will, you know, tell you a little bit about this last, this last part. Um, um, so now I want to switch. So far, I've been talking about um, the algorithmic decision-making context. Now I want to switch to auditing human decision-makers. Um, so in the 1950s in the, in the U.S., um, Black employees could only work in the lowest paid departments at Duke Power Company. So this was a, a North Carolina power company. 1950s, there was explicit racial discrimination. Black employees could only work in the lowest paid department. So this, um, in 1964, this became, or actually, you know, January 1st, 1965, this became illegal to have this type of explicit racial classification. And so the day after that law, the Civil Rights Act went into effect, Duke Power ended explicit racial classification, and they instead required a high school diploma and these intelligence tests, okay, for that are required for promotion. So they're like, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing explicit racial classification anymore, but we're doing these types of tests to determine who is who is promoted. Now, this you know, at the time, seemed like plausibly this was this would be legal. It's not explicit classification, um, and the Supreme Court looked at this case. So people, you know, the the uh, employee sued. It went to the Supreme Court in 1971. Supreme Court decided this, in fact, was illegal, and it was not illegal for the same reason that using explicit racial classifications were illegal. So in that case, it was really a story about animus, about intent. So explicit racial classifications were illegal because of intent. Here, the Supreme Court said that it was illegal because it violated this, uh, this principle of disparate impact, saying that these tests in the high school diploma requirement didn't actually lead to better job performance, but they had a racially disparate impact. Okay, and so this is the, you know, it's a very different argument than the argument against using explicit racial classification of saying it's like, even if you have the best of intentions, if you set up hiring criteria that end up not being useful to identify people who would be good at the job, but create a disparate burden on certain groups defined by race, then it is unlawful under this principle of disparate impact. Okay, so it's a very different thing. So now the um, the standard way of measuring discrimination in court cases to this day is a kitchen sink regression. So what do I mean by kitchen sink regression? It means you have some outcome that you care about. Um, let's say a decision, like a hiring decision. We throw in everything we know about the employee, and then we look at the residual on race. You know, how much you know, is unexplained, or how much of that, of that gap is explained by race itself. And so we throw in everything. And in particular, in the case of Griggs, under that kind of formulation, we would throw in education. We would throw in the results of these intelligence tests and would say, is there any difference here that's explained by race itself after accounting for all this stuff? Um, if you do that in Griggs, you would find that there's nothing else there. And so you would conclude that there's no discrimination. So what went wrong is we shouldn't be throwing in the kitchen sink when we're running this type of regression when our goal is not disparate treatment, but disparate impact, right? In Griggs, the whole point, the whole argument was that 
you shouldn't be accounting for things like education and intelligence tests because those are not related to the outcome that we care about, successful job performance, but they are related to race. Okay, and so throwing them in masks that uh, 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 that connection. Okay, is everyone kind of with me so far? Good. Um, so yes. Yeah. And it will still be uh, unfair yeah. in the sense of the impact. Is that kind of similar to that? Um, so, it, so, so I would say in a, in a kind of strict sense, that would be a case where if you really are thresholding on the real kind of probability of success, that would probably be a case where there's not clear disparate impact. It's still, you still might not like it, but it would probably be legal in this disparate impact sense. So here I'm gonna show you but the, the case of how do we even measure disparate impact? And so in this case, if we really know that something like high school diploma is truly irrelevant, which is what the court decided, then we just wouldn't adjust for it in our regression. And we would say, okay, we're only adjusting for legitimate factors. And if we only adjust for legitimate factors, this is the racial disparity. And so then we would say there is disparate impact or there's not disparate impact. Okay, so the problem here now is what is legitimate? And this is the hard thing. And so right now, the way the courts decide this is kind of going through by hand and determining, you know, is this legitimate? Is that legitimate? How much does this matter? Which is a difficult thing to really reason about and is, and is um, obviously a fraud issue. Okay, so we are going to take an alternative approach that is, I would say, a more kind of statistically grounded approach to this problem of measuring disparate impact. Um, and I'm going to apply this strategy to policing in New York City. So officers can legally frisk a stopped individual if they have reasonable suspicion that that person is armed and dangerous. So we have a legal basis for a frisk is just a search. It's kind of a, a brief search of somebody. Um, if they believe that they're dangerous, then they can frisk them. And so the outcome here is pretty clear that, you know, ex post at least, we should frisk people who have weapons. We shouldn't frisk people who don't don't have weapons. And so what is step one? We're gonna look, we're gonna estimate for every individual, the likelihood that they're carrying a weapon based on all of the available data. So we have a lot of data on, on people and we know, you know, we know like where they are. Um, we know what kind of factors that officers are, are thinking about that they write down in their form. It's like, were they, you know, going around a block several times? Do they have like a bulky coat on? We have all this information so we can fit some rich model that tries to estimate the risk of somebody having a weapon um, uh, when they're stopped based on this data set. Okay, so now step two is we're gonna measure racial disparities only after adjusting for this estimated risk from the model. Okay, so what does this look like? So here's my estimated risk. This is what I get from the model, the probability that any person has a weapon. Here is the probability of being frisked, which is separated by race group, black, Hispanic, and, and white folks in our data set. And what we see here is that racial minorities, at the same nominal, or at the same kind of empirical risk level are much more likely to be frisked. And so this is what we call disparate impact. So this gap here is what we call disparate impact. And that the same basis of, of evidence of having a weapon, the thing that you ultimately care about, you're, you're, um, uh, you're much more likely to engage in this behavior for racial minorities rather than white folks. And if we think about in the Griggs case, if we say, what is the likelihood, you know, if we knew for everybody how productive you are, we could estimate that based on the available information at the time of the promotion decision. We'd say for two people who are equally productive, do we have promotion rates that are comparable across race groups or not? And if we don't, we call that disparate impact. Okay, so here, one way if we just wanna get, there are many ways to summarize that, that type of plot. Here, I'm just going to say, well, let's think about this as a regression where the coefficient on race, when we only adjust for risk, when we're trying to predict risk based on race and risk, when we say the coefficient on race is our measure of disparate impact. Okay, so for among people with the same risk level, 
what is the racial gap in frisk rates? That's our measure of, of disparate impact. Okay, so let me show you some, uh, you know, how it plays out in this case. So here, this is just the raw disparity of saying for black and Hispanic folks relative to white people, what is the estimate, what, you know, what is the, in the raw data, how much more likely are you to be frisked? And it's about, you know, 12 percentage points more likely to be frisked if you're black or Hispanic compared to if you're white, just overall in the data. So now if we do a kitchen sink regression, there's a standard approach to measuring discrimination. It goes way down, it's still positive, but you know, it's about three, 4%. Okay, so this is throw in the kitchen sink and say adjusting for everything we know about, what is the extra probability that you are to be frisked if you are black or Hispanic? Okay, so it goes way down. But now if we do a risk adjusted regression that's designed to estimate disparate impact, the numbers go way back up. And here we end up back at around 15%, and they're in fact higher than in the raw disparities. So it's saying here, if we adjust only for your risk of having a weapon, which itself was estimated using a kitchen sink, but at the end, we only care about risk of having a weapon, then the probability of being frisked, these disparities go way back up again. And why are they even higher than in the raw um, in, the, in the raw population, because the people who are being stopped, if you're Black or Hispanic, are in fact less risky on average than people who are white who are being stopped. And so when you measure disparate impact, and in fact, it's even higher than the raw numbers and it's significantly higher than if you were to do a kitchen sink regression. And here, this is a case where you, you would conclude that there's discrimination in both of these cases. But you can imagine cases where if you do a kitchen sink regression, this goes down to zero, but you still have disparate impact over here, okay? So you can get kind of qualitatively different answers depending on what type of approach you're, approach you're using. Okay, so um, let me give you sort of one, oh, I'll give you kind of one more technical piece of this. So now one big assumption here is that we have accurate estimates of risk itself. You know, this is this problem omitted variable bias of saying it's like, well, how do I know that this is what your true estimate of having uh, a weapon really is. And so we deal with this with a, uh, a sensitivity analysis that I'm not going to talk about too much, but I'm just going to show you the, the results. So we say that let's assume that there's some true estimate or there's some true risk out there, and we have an estimate of it. Now here, what I'm showing you is how far, I'm going to make assumptions on how far my true risk is from the actual risk that I'm estimating. And if I'm off by a factor of four in the odds of my estimated risk and the true risk, then this is what, this is kind of the, the maximum my estimate of disparate impact could actually change. Okay, so this turns out to be a slightly um, subtle statistical kind of problem to solve, but you can, you can do it exactly, turns out, in saying, in this case, if I have, you can compute the worst case the, the ways in which the risk could be off in the worst way to change your estimates the most, and you end up getting these kind of cones, okay? And so the here, how do you interpret these things? Well, we tried to calibrate it by saying, if you have a two and a half, if you're kind of off by about two and a half, that means that that's the same level that you'd be off by if you're to throw out almost all the information in the data. And you're saying we have all these features. If we throw out nearly everything, then we're still going to be able to estimate things by about you know, this factor of two and a half. And in that case, we still have pretty large disparities. And so this is kind of one way of thinking about sensitivity analysis is imagine that there's some omitted information out there that's on the scale of everything that you have available to you. And if you were to do that exercise, then you end up with pretty significant um, uh, uh, still pretty significant estimates of, of disparate impact. Okay, um, so let's see here. I can, I have five more minutes. Is that too much? Too much? Okay, let's, uh, let's, just, let's just go for it. So I wanna, I'll, I'll tell you about one, you know, last piece of disparate impact that I've been thinking about recently, um, which is related to this affirmative action case, which has been going on and at, um, in the US and, and playing out at Harvard in particular. And so um, students for fair admission, they argue that Harvard has imposed an, what they call an illegal Asian penalty um, that is designed, they claim to reduce the number of Asian Americans on 
on um, the Harvard campus. And so the you know the bigger point of this lawsuit is to eliminate affirmative action and the in the argument that this that the SFFA students for for admission is is making is that look you know there Harvard and these other universities are using race illegally they can't be trusted to use race in a lawful manner to um, uh, uh, design affirmative action policies and so therefore the remedy they argue is to eliminate affirmative action altogether. Um, so one thing kind of before we go into the details of this is that there's this kind of funny argument that is playing out in that the case is strategically about affirmative action, but nominally it's about an Asian penalty. So in theory, even if the facts of the case or the argument that the, the plaintiffs are making is that in fact there is an Asian penalty, well, one remedy for that is you could just eliminate that, that penalty and admit Asian students at the same rates that you admit white students. There's no sort of direct need to offend to eliminate affirmative action, but this is one of these things that's been played out very, I would say, in a confusing way in the popular press, is tying an Asian penalty with affirmative action itself. So really, these are kind of conceptually distinct issues, but they've been um, kind of strategically tied together in, in, in this particular case. Okay, so now let's like think about what does disparate impact look like in this case, and how can we use these ideas of included variable bias to think about this particular case. Um, so about 6% of Asian American applicants were admitted to, to Harvard compared to about 8% of, of white applicants. Um, and I'm only comparing Asian American and white applicants because like I said, these are issues that are completely distinct from affirmative action for groups that are have, have been historically underrepresented in, in, in college admissions. Um, so you have a lower acceptance rate for Asian American students compared to white students. Um, and it turns out that Asian American applicants also have stronger academic credentials and extracurricular activities on average than, than white students. Um, and so this is largely what the, the plaintiffs in the case are pointing to. Um, now, Harvard argues that of course, you know, we the university cares about things that go beyond um, uh, 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 test scores beyond GPA, beyond extracurricular activities, and cares about distinguishing excellences, you know, quote unquote, distinguishing excellences. So what are these distinguishing excellences? You know, things like legacy status, athleticism, personal rating, geography, parental occupation. And it turns out that if you were to run these types of regression, and this is really what, you know, kind of have a thousand pages of expert testimony in these, in this case, but really it's about running two regressions at the end of the day. So one regression is a kitchen sink regression. This is roughly what you know, the Harvard side is doing. It's say, look, there's no real racial gap after you adjust for all this stuff. The other side is saying there's a significant racial gap when you adjust only for academics and extracurriculars. And so now we're very much in the same place that we were in this previous style of analysis of what should we include in these models when we're trying to determine whether or not there was unlawful discrimination. And so, you know, the one side of this is this disparate treatment theory of, of discrimination. And this is what SFFA is alleging. So explicit racial animus. And if your theory of discrimination is explicit racial animus, um, then we should throw in the kitchen sink. Okay, that's kind of the argument, throw in, throw in everything. Now there's this other theory of discrimination that we're talking about a disparate impact. And this is about unjustifiably imposing burdens on race groups. And so if we believe that things like geography and legacy shouldn't really matter in determining you know, who we should be admitting into universities, then if we adjust for those factors in this type of analysis, then we'll be masking the form of discrimination that we care about, disparate impact. So disparate impact is not actually alleged in, in this particular case. And you know, for their legal reasons why that's true, there's kind of, this is on shaky ground, the extent to which disparate impact doctrine applies to college admissions. Um, and so this is, I would say, one reason why this argument isn't being raised in the case, but we can still think through it conceptually, kind of regardless of the kind of legal ramifications, are we operating under this disparate treatment version of discrimination, or are we operating under a disparate impact version of discrimination? And these two different versions, these theories of discrimination directly affect what variables we include in our model when we're trying to estimate whether or not there's there's discrimination. So I will I'll end with with that kind of 
food for thought and just kind of recapping, we saw these issues with label bias. So when you have label bias, which I contend is happening in almost all of these policy relevant examples, we have to be very careful about a kitchen sink approach to, to developing these predictive models. Even when features are predictive, for example, in diabetes, the gains can be smaller than is often believed, which again can has implications for why, how we design these types of algorithms. And then finally, the standard approach to discrimination, throw in the kitchen sink, adjust for everything, can make sense when we're trying to estimate something like disparate treatment, but it is very problematic when we're trying to estimate something like disparate impact. And a lot of our kind of contemporary policy debates, I would say, are due to this conflation of disparate treatment and disparate impact, which boils down to what factors are we adjusting for when we when we think about disparities. Um, so I'll end with that. And, and here are a few papers that that um, talk about what I've when I've gone over today. Thanks, everybody. Please. Yeah, so I, sorry, I'm using kind of statistics terminology here. So adjusting, I really just mean throwing it into the model. And so other people might say controlling for, um, or, you know, I'm just throwing those features into the model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the, the, the translation barrier between ML and statistics and all these other kind of related fields. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, the, so the question, if I understand it, is, you know, can we kind of sequentially add features until we detect some bias and then stop there? I think the issue is that it's not entirely clear what we mean by bias. And so we definitely can design algorithms that have you know, certain outcomes that we might want. We might say, well, we want to hire people at the same rate across race groups. Um, but it's not entirely clear, you know, if there are differences, like in a diabetes example, where there are, there seem to be differences across groups, then if we do this sort of procedure, we're forcing an outcome that might not be aligned with what is, you know, medically recommended, for example. Yeah. Um, I, so here, I mean, there is this question of, you know, are these issues really a, a, about representation of the data? And the way I think about this, at least the way I've, I've talked about it today, is the number of examples is much, much larger than the number of features, even across groups. And so we're in a situation where we're not worried about that. We can fit separate models for every race group. We can fill these like very flexible models with lots of interactions. And so here I'm in a wor world where there's no statistical estimation error. So it's not about kind of we're, we're pooling too much towards the, the dominant group. It's like these are situations where we don't think that's the issue just to get to the kind of core problem of, you know, how do we, what do we do even in this best case scenario? But I agree that there are situations where you might have, you know, deeply imbalanced data sets, and then you have other problems that you have to contend with. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Terrific. Looking forward to chatting more there.